Our scriptures this morning from the lectionary, the first one is from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, page 705 in your pew Bible. The Lord's case against Israel. Listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people Israel. He will prosecute them to the full extent of the law. O my people, what have I done to make you turn from me? Tell me why your patience is exhausted. Answer me. For I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from your slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember, my people, how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed, and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead? And remember your journey from Achaia to Gilgal, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness? What can we bring to the Lord to make up for what we've done? Should we bow before God with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Would that please the Lord? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for the sins of our souls? Would that make him glad? No, O people. The Lord has already told you what is good, and this is what he requires. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We will also read Psalm number 15, page Uh, Actually, we're going to read it from the Psalter. We'll read it responsively, but we will not sing a refrain. And our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. The Sermon on the Mount, and specifically this morning, the Beatitudes. One day as the crowds were gathering, Jesus went up to the mountainside with his disciples and sat down to teach them. This is what he taught them. God blesses those who realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is given to them. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are gentle and lowly, for the whole earth will belong to them. God blesses those who are hungry and thirsty for justice, for they will receive it in full. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted because they live for God, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when you are mocked and persecuted and lied about because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted too. This is the word of the Lord. When I was a kid, I, we didn't have cable growing up. Uh, and uh, so I was one of those kids that uh, you sometimes hear joke about. We had two stations, CBC and TVO. Uh, and that was fine. Um, but it, it meant that I went to my grandma Durstein's a lot. Uh, I went to my grandma Durstein's a lot for three reasons. Canada dry ginger ale, processed cheese slices, my dad would be laughing if he was here, as these things were not allowed at our house, and cable. Uh, And grandma liked to watch a lot of interesting things like uh, WWF wrestling, which she pretended only to watch for Joel and I, uh, except she was pretty into it. Uh, She really liked the body slam and Andre the Giant, turns out. And she was into her 80s by this point. (laughs) She'd be like, body slam him! (laughs) Which, yeah, if you knew her, that was very funny. Uh, (laughs) But we also watched a lot of Matlock together, she and I. And I really liked Matlock uh, and all those kinds of shows. Uh, And I still really like the the crime dramas, uh, especially the ones with the courtroom scenes. Although I am finding it is less fun to be in court than to watch shows about court. 
<laughs> a lot less fun. <laughs> but but court shows were really exciting to me because I liked the the idea of like tracking down the evidence and figuring it out and trying to f- convince, figure out how you were going to get the guy in the stand to slip up. Right? This is it's just so much fun, isn't it, John? Yeah, it's so much fun to be a lawyer and figure out how to convince them to to confess on the stand and slip up and and solve these great cases. And I really liked it, the figuring out and and of course the the drama TV makes everything so much more exciting and easy, right? Um, but anyways, I really, I really enjoyed those shows. And uh, so when I was in seminary and, and my undergrad and started realizing that there were parts of scripture that were set up like court cases, this was very exciting to me. Uh, they're not as straightforward as, as the simplistic drama of, of a Matlock episode, but, um, but I, I really find this this imagery of, of a court scene and, and evidence and all these sort of things kind of compelling. And I got thinking about Matlock this week, enough to watch a few episodes on YouTube. Fun fact, you can watch whole episodes of Matlock on YouTube if you need a Matlock fix. Uh, and, and Micah 6 is one of those court case sort of passages in scripture because uh, God and, the, and the, the Israelite nation of the Old Testament are in controversy. Can you imagine? <laughs> We've never seen that happen, right? That the ancient Israelites and God are in a dispute. Like every prophetic passage we've ever read basically comes down to they're complaining and he's annoyed about it. <laughs> well, not really annoyed, but he's saying, what's the deal? So in our court scenario of Micah 6, uh, the accused, so to speak, would be Israel. Uh, they are accused of being unreasonably ungrateful towards God. They are complaining loudly about him. And God, f- f- and, and frankly, God wants to know why. So in verse 3, he very directly asks them and basically says, Answer me. Tell me, what is your problem? Why are you so, why are you complaining about me again? What have I done? The prosecution, not surprisingly then, if we were going to go with this language, would be God, I guess. Sort of the one saying, what's the problem? Um, And almost in a surprise turn of events, the judge, if we were to put it in a structure we can understand, seems to almost be the prophet Micah. Because he kind of gives the verdict, the what needs to happen here to resolve things. But if we understand it that way, we have to be sure that we know he's acting on behalf of God, certainly not from his own authority. So with that sort of premise, that loose premise of who's who, the, the scene, the trial of sorts, unfolds like this. In the first scene, we have God starting with what's the problem, right? What's the problem here? God begins in the first three verses by asking the people what their issue is. Basically, he's brought this whole scene together uh, and he's standing up. His opening remarks are essentially, what is your problem? What's the beef? What's the issue? Uh, And his openness in this is really quite remarkable. He's not just dismissing their concern. He's not saying, oh, you're complaining again. I don't want to hear it. Get out of my sight. Like, you know, quit your whining. But he actually is genuinely interested to hear from them what is the basis of their complaint. Uh, He's not dismissing it and saying it's inappropriate for them to bring up this complaint uh, or angry that they've dared to complain or question him. But instead, he wants to understand their concern. He desires to know what it is that's bothering them. So that's scene one. In scene two, uh, we don't get a response in scene one, but it seems that God has has gleaned or had some understanding of what their problem might be. In scene two, God begins the, remember when, remember when I did, remember when this happened. In scene two, God begins to address their complaint. Uh, and explains why it perplexes him, or why it bothers him, or why he doesn't understand that they are complaining. He outlines reasons why, in fact, he thinks that instead of complaining, they should be grateful for and appreciative of the activity that he's 
done in their life, even though their current situation is difficult. He reminds them of the ways that he's been faithful to them. Um, He reminds them that he has brought them out of slavery in Egypt through Moses and Miriam and Aaron. And in reminding them of that, he reminds them of things like leading them through the Red Sea and feeding them bread from heaven and producing birds on a daily basis in the middle of the desert. He reminds them that he's delivered them from death threats by foreign kings on numerous occasions, sometimes causing donkeys to speak in order to prevent the death. He reminds them that he's delivered them into a good and beautiful land. Uh, And to back up his story, he's brought nature in as a witness. He's called all of nature as a witness to the stand. Confronted with this reminder of God's faithfulness, in scene three, the people stop and go, oh yeah, you have done all of that. And we are complaining a lot. Maybe we are a wee bit out of line. We're sorry. And so in the third scene of this sort of trial or this process, this unfolding scene, the Israelites take God's point to heart. And they realize that no matter what it is that they're currently facing and the situation they're in, God has been faithful to them. And questioning where he has them now does seem a bit over the top because they know that he's been faithful in the past and they can trust him in the present. And so uh, they feel quite remorseful. Uh, And so they begin suggesting all kinds of things that they could do to make up for their lack of faith in him. But their suggestions are all over the map. They start with really normal things like the traditional, you know, well, we'll we'll make a sacrifice uh, to show that we're sorry, to really bizarre stuff like, well like hysterical, like, well, we're so sorry. Should we, should we sacrifice our firstborn child? And you can almost hear God being like, what? That's way out of left field. I've never asked you to do something crazy like that. Just that one time with Abraham, but that's, a, that's an anomaly. That's way over there. So it's hard to know in that moment if they're really being serious here or if they're just kind of trying to show that they're so sorry they would do anything. Either way, this trial comes to an end with Micah finally speaking. And when Micah finally enters this story of of God having made his case and reminding the people of his faithfulness and them feeling remorse, Micah stands up and addresses the room. And you can almost envision it. He comes into this, this, this room and he almost like, you know, he stands up and kind of smooths his robes and says, just calm down to the people, right? And says, what he points out to the people is that the basic issue that has been at stake in all of this conversation they've been having with God is not their outer life, but their inner life. The way in which they have thought about and interacted with God. And so he says to them, should you do all these things? Do you need to do these extravagant, outrageous acts? No, O people. The Lord has already told you what is good. This is what the Lord requires of you. To do what is just and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And suddenly in this court scene, you can almost see this moment of collective, oh yeah, right? Because in those words, no people, the Lord has already told you, implies this sense of collective remembering. Oh yeah, the Lord already has told us. Because in in Hosea, earlier, not that many years earlier, in Hosea, the prophet had told them in a similar circumstance, come back to your God, act on the principles of love and justice, and always live in confident dependence on your God. In a similar situation of unfaithfulness and uncertainty in the faithfulness of God, in a similar situation of complaining against God and not knowing if he was going to be with him, God had said this same thing to his people. Because this is what the Lord required then and still requires and has always required of those who are members of the community of faith. 
that we would do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. To love God and from that love of him, to live our lives in love and service of others. The orientation towards both our neighbor and God is clear. Giving ourselves on behalf of others by doing justice and loving kindness, while at the same time walking humbly and attentively with God, is at the core of what the Lord requires of us. And the gospel reading from Matthew 5 today demonstrates that these same themes of doing justice and loving mercy and walking humbly with God were of importance to Jesus as he began his ministry and outlined what it meant for the kingdom of God to be near. At the very beginning of his last week in Matthew 4, we talked about Jesus calling disciples and beginning to preach and teach the kingdom of God. And the Sermon on the Mount covers all of Matthew 5 to 7, three whole chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. And it casts a vision of that kingdom. And that vision does not get any easier to embody and live out as time passes. At its center, it's a vision that focuses on justice and mercy, and all because we humbly walk with God. It deals with themes like forgiveness and loving enemies and praying for them, giving to charity privately and not for public praise, how to be angry without sinning, and all kinds of things. And in the 12 verses we read today, Jesus declares that God's blessing and pleasure is given to those who realize their need for him, who mourn, who are gentle and lowly, are hungry and thirsty for justice, are merciful, have hearts that are pure, work for peace, and are persecuted because they live for God in the ways he calls them to. Who wants to sign up for God's blessing right now just based on that criteria? Oh, thank you. I, that was more hands than I expected. That, like, that, honestly, that just makes a minister's heart grow. <laughs> Really, honestly, that, thank you. <laughs> because that is, that, is, that is beautiful. Because that is a far cry from the very popular Jesus wants you healthy and wealthy gospel that permeates so much Christian television these days. It really is. Honestly, you just gave me the best gift. <laughs> I'm going to go home and write that down. <laughs> It is so tempting to want to take the wild and revolutionary words of Jesus' first sermon and domesticate them, tame them like a wild animal. To want to knock the corners and the edges off it so that it hurts less when we bump into it with the reality of our lives. Because if the words of Matthew 5 were simply handed down by some distant and unknowable authority, devoid of any relationship or compassionate love, they would be suffocating. But just as the Ten Commandments and the decrees of prophets like Micah were given in the context of relationship and remembering the goodness and faithfulness of God, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and these verses about whom God blesses are given in the context of recalling who God is. These verses aren't separated from God's faithfulness mirrored in stories of demons being cast out or the sick being healed or crowds being fed and our own personal experiences of his grace and love. These verses don't call us to moralistic living so much as to a response of gratitude for God's grace. We're called to live this way as an embodiment of our thanksgiving for his actions. There are hard questions to be asked by trying to live this way. And if we're honest, it can seem like nonsense to try. But as we remember the words of Micah, that we are to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. No, but we do this as we remember the words. Jesus, it seems, is asking us to do the same. So we ask prayerfully, how can weakness be powerful? How can peacemakers thrive in a world tinged with violence? How can my gentle and lowly spirit be used by God in a world full of loud and aggressive people? 
The answer is in small but meaningful ways. We've been told a lie as a society that the only actions that matter are the big and the spectacular ones. If you can't solve the whole problem, then why bother trying? But you and I know that that's just not true. Every little bit makes a difference. I've probably used it before because I love this story. But there's a First Nations story of, a, of the hummingbird. I think I've probably used it. But if I have, you can follow along in your minds. Who, in the midst of a forest fire, goes and scoops little bits of water out of a puddle and a lake and flies back and forth and back and forth with her little mouthful of water dropping it. And the big bear makes fun of her and the fox makes fun of her. And they question what she's doing. And she says, I'm bringing water back to put out the fire. And when they scoff at that, she continues because she won't put out the full fire, but she's trying. And if all of the hummingbirds and all of the animals brought some water, it would begin to make a difference in a, in a small way. And in a way, that is what we do. Uh, Jesus tells the story of the kingdom of God, the Jesus way, as we often phrase it here, being like yeast and leaven in a bread, right? So small when we put it in, so tiny, but it spreads through the whole thing and changes it. Coffee for our neighbors. I, I was, um, Matt MacArthur and I have been chatting a lot lately. He sends me the most fascinating things. He says I can use his name now, so I don't have to be so. Last week I vaguely referenced him. This week I can say his name. Sends me the most fascinating things to read. We've been sending stuff back and forth all week about this man who just sets up coffee at the end of his driveway for his neighbors. And people stop and they chit-chat and things. Uh, coffee for our neighbors or a prayer shawl ministry. My aunt's church started making prayer shawls and they pray over them and they give them to people who are lonely or, or having chemo treatments or going to seminary or just whoever they think could need one. And they've made 300 of the things. And they tell them that they've been prayed over and prayed for and things. There's so many just small ways that we can make a difference. Uh, Evangel Hall, they feed 150 people every night. They're not solving the problem of hunger and homelessness in Toronto, but they're making a big difference for those 150 people every day, right? And so all of these small, these small but meaningful things. Living a life that pleases God. Oh, not quite. Living a life that pleases God, that includes doing justice and loving mercy and walking humbly and attentively with him is not always easy, but it's always worth it. We're going to sing one more step along the world I go in a minute. It's a peppy song, but it has some really good theology in it. So don't let that get missed in the middle of the pep. It talks about from the old things to the new, keep me traveling with you. As we move from old ways to new ways, from the world's ways to God's ways, from our ways to the Jesus ways, we do so with a faithful God. Where we see no way to go, Christ is there telling us the way. We can know that. We pray in this song for him to give us courage when the world is rough and keep us loving in the world when it's tough. The last verse, I think, is the most profound because it reminds us that the one that we follow, the God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, who we follow, and the Holy Spirit that empowers us, is older than the world can be and yet younger than the life that is in us. He is ever old and ever new, and that is who we travel with. The God we serve, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, always has been, always will be, and is with us now. And as we follow him, as we seek to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God, let's do so hoping and trusting that all glory will be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, who was in the beginning, is now, and evermore will be, worlds without end. Amen. Let's sing now one more step along the world I go. And pay attention to the depth of the words in this peppy song. <laughs>